Good evening and welcome to the Daily News Roundup. I am Abigail Smythe. Coming up in this evening's newscast, Health Minister confirms death of 12 babies at Victoria Jubilee Hospital. St. Catherine Police search for gunman who shot and killed senior citizen. Wanted man shot and killed during confrontation with police in St. James. School-age children commit 52 gun-related murders in Jamaica. Sajikor branch manager implicated in multi-million dollar fraud. In business, business confidence increases by double-digit levels. In the region, historic firm First direct flight between Antigua and West Africa to arrive soon. On the international scene, United Nations warns that the planet is heading for climate catastrophe. And in sports, Barcelona eliminated from the Champions League. Now for the news in detail. Health Minister Dr. Christopher Tufton has confirmed that 12 babies died from a bacterial outbreak at the Victoria Jubilee Hospital over the last four months. Dr. Tufton says a team from the Pan-American Health Organization, PAHO, was called in to cauterize the situation and have been successful in reducing the number of infections over the last three months, with only one baby dying in October. However, he was unable to confirm if the bacterial outbreak was eradicated. There were allegations that the Ministry of Health attempted to cover up the issue. However, Dr. Tufton denies the allegations and says the public was not yet informed because he is awaiting a report from the PAHO team. The health minister says a severe shortage of nurses could have led to the outbreak of the resistant bacteria. He reveals that the ratio of nurses to babies in the neonatal intensive care unit should be one nurse to two babies. However, with the Jamaica place by a severe nursing shortage due to the high number of nurses migrating each year, there is now one nurse to eight babies, sometimes more. Dr. Tufton has Dr. Tufton says rather this does create a challenge for infection prevention and control. In 2015, the then health minister, Dr. Fenton Ferguson, was relieved of the portfolio due to public backlash over a similar outbreak, which resulted in the death of 18 babies. The St. Catherine police are searching for a gunman who shot and killed a senior citizen on Jones Avenue Wednesday morning. The deceased man, Harvey Clark, is a 72-year-old retiree of Gordon Boulevard, Ensom City, St. Catherine. Reports are that Clark went to the Jones Avenue community outside Spanish Town about 10.30 a.m. to deliver food to a friend. While Clark was standing outside the friend's home, explosions were heard and he was later found suffering from gunshot wounds. The police were summoned and checks revealed that Clark was hit in his forehead and abdomen. He was pronounced dead at the Spanish Town Hospital. And a woman was shot and killed at a bar in Bickersteth, St. James, Wednesday night. She is yet to be identified by the police. The police report that about 9 o'clock, the woman was among patrons at the bar when a motor car drove up. It is further reported that two men alighted from the vehicle, brandished handguns and ran inside the bar. The men then opened fire, hitting the woman multiple times before escaping in the awaiting car. The police were summoned and upon their arrival, the woman was discovered suffering from multiple gunshot wounds. She was rushed to the Cornwall Regional Hospital where she was pronounced dead. A wanted man from Cambridge, St. James, was shot and killed during a confrontation with police Wednesday afternoon. He has been identified as 28-year-old Daniel Daly, otherwise called McGill. The Cambridge police report that about 1.40 p.m., a team carried out an operation in a section of Cambridge called Jungle in search of Daly. He was wanted for a case of shooting with intent committed in Cambridge Square in, on April 20. Police reports say the team came under heavy gunfire while approaching a house surrounded by vegetation. The police say the fire was returned and when the shooting subsided, Daly was found suffering from gunshot wounds while reportedly clutching a handgun. They say three other gunmen escaped on foot in the area. A member of the police team was treated at hospital for a sprained ankle. The Independent Commission of Investigations, Indicom, is probing the incident. 
Residents of Elliston District near Spurtry in Manchester carried out a protest on Wednesday over Tuesday's fatal shooting of a man by the police. 31-year-old Audley Walker was killed during a police military operation. The residents claim Walker, otherwise called Shaba, was awakened from his sleep and killed. They are demanding answers. They claim that Walker, who the police say was wanted, was stopped and searched by the police just a few days ago and was not picked up then. They add that he was reporting to the Black River Police Station on Wednesdays and Saturdays. One resident says Walker died in his underpants. Police reports say Walker was fatally shot in a confrontation with the police about 5.55 a.m. and a 9mm handgun seized in the incident. However, the residents are questioning the police's report and say they are yet to receive information about the gun and his body. The Inspectorate and Professional Standards Oversight Bureau and the Independent Commission of Investigations are investigating the incident. Another man has been charged for the shooting death of a shopkeeper in Westmoreland in May. 22-year-old Sean Blackwood of Pike District Bethel Town in the parish has been charged with murder and illegal possession of firearm. He is charged in relation to the death of Magdalene Clark, who was gunned down along the Belvedere Main Road on Saturday, May 14. His court date is being finalized. It is alleged that about 10.30 p.m., Blackwood and another man attacked Clark as she was closing her grocery shop. She was shot several times in the upper body. Investigations led to Blackwood's arrest. He was charged after being pointed out on an identification parade. Previously, the police charged 20-year-old farmer Justin Barnes, also of Pike District, in relation to the fatal shooting. He was taken into custody on Friday, June 24, and was subsequently charged on Tuesday, June 28, after a question-and-answer session was conducted with him in the presence of his attorney. The Ministry of Education and Youth has launched an investigation into Wednesday's incident at Oberlin High School that left students acting abnormally. Following a religious exercise, students fell to the ground, some kicking and screaming, while some fainted. The ministry says the investigation will help to determine the protocols for school devotions. Minister of Education Favel Williams says, quote, While we encourage devotion in schools, our school leaders have a responsibility to exercise caution as to content and likely impact on students as evidenced by the reaction of students at Oberlin High School, end quote. The administration at Oberlin High School reported that during the devotional exercise, a teacher who was leading the worship was speaking in tongues which triggered a chain reaction of similar expression among some students. Some students had to be taken to the school nurse's office. The education ministry said after the devotion, students were sent to classes, but some stated that they were afraid because of what happened, and others showed what was described as abnormal behavior. The administration then took the decision to dismiss school at 10 a.m. There is a confirmation from Education Minister Favel Williams that a brawl involving female students at the Grange Hill High School in Westmoreland was a spillover from a conflict between their families. Minister Williams says that the four students who were separated by staff are from the same community. A 30-second video of the incident surfaced on social media platforms on Tuesday, but is, it is not clear when the incident occurred. The minister says an all-of-government, all-of-country approach must be taken in addressing these long-standing issues. Last week, the Ministry of Education launched its Just Medsit campaign to end violence in schools. She says a UNICEF 2018 situational analysis has informed the government that approximately 80 percent or 300,000 Jamaican children experience some form of psychological or physical violence administered as this discipline and approximately 60 percent or 240,000 students are bullied at school while 79 percent or 296,000 witness violence in the home or community. Minister Williams says, quote, given these figures, we should not be alarmed that we're seeing violent behavior among our children, end quote. She says students are showing up to school psychologically and physically abused.
The Education Minister further states that there is an epidemic of violence among children and that it is a mammoth task that cannot be left to guidance counselors, deans of discipline, senior teachers and school resource officers. She notes that what is happening in schools is not normal. She says it is a result of major psychosocial issues which include family problems, depression, anxiety, substance abuse, sexual abuse and violence. She adds that, quote, if we were not convinced before, we are now and we have to treat with the emotional and psychological well-being of our children and their families in a more focused and concentrated way, end quote. In the meantime, there are calls for increased action to keep firearms out of the hands of students and away from learning institutions. This as statistics show that school-age children have committed 52 gun-related murders and 82 shootings in Jamaica since 2018. The issue of violence perpetrated by students was placed in the spotlight at a virtual roundtable meeting hosted by the United Nations Regional Center for Peace, Disarmament, and development in Latin America and the Caribbean on Wednesday. National Coordinator of the Jamaica Constabulary Forces Safe Schools Program, Inspector Tanisia Johnson, who spoke on behalf of Jamaica, said that now more than ever, there is a higher chance that students will be able to obtain and use firearms in schools. She used data since 2018 to highlight what she said was a crisis situation, giving the police grounds for concern. Over the nearly five years, there were 82 shooting incidents and 52 gun-related murders among school-age students. There were also 92 incidents of online bullying and 456 conflicts involving students, 48 of which resulted in injuries. In addition, 36 robberies, including seven involving a gun, have been reported within and outside the school compounds. Inspector Johnson noted that there are 10 active gangs in the school system with 106 reported cases of extortion over the period, during which school resource officers seized 406 knives, 385 pairs of scissors, 41 machetes and 8 firearms, four of which were found on school property. She added that under the Safe Schools Mentorship Program, which was created to help institutions deal with the violence, antisocial behavior, truancy, children at risk and maintain overall peace and safety, some 234 school resource officers have been deployed island-wide. Manager of the Ligony branch of Sajikor Bank in St. Andrew, Tricia Moulton, has been implicated in the uncovering of the alleged fraud involving more than $50 million. Moulton and, other em and another employee, Malika McLeod, a personal banker, have been charged with various offenses, including conspiracy to defraud and breaches of the Proceeds of Crime Act. The two workers are each on $1 million station bail and are expected to appear in court on December 9. King's counsel Peter Champagny confirmed he has been retained by McLeod but has declined to comment on the case. It's alleged that between August and October this year, the women conspired and defrauded U.S. currency accounts belonging to several Sajikor customers using fraudulent accounts they created. Sajikor says its management uncovered the fraudulent activities through its internal security systems. It further states that the investigation was handed over to the Jamaica Constabulary Force on Friday, October 21, and the implicated employees have been suspended to facilitate the process of the investigation. Sajikor is seeking to assure its customers that it takes the security and protection of their assets very seriously, constantly reviewing operations rigorously in order to promptly detect anomalies and liaise with the authorities to ensure that those responsible face the full legal ramifications. The policeman charged for leaving his infant daughter in his car resulting in her death is to return to court on November 17. Detective Sergeant Sheldon Dobson, who is charged with manslaughter, had his bail further extended when he appeared before the St. Elizabeth Parish Court on Tuesday. The attorney at law representing Dobson, Thomas Levine, says presiding Judge Roderick Smith set the November 17 date to allow enough time for documents from the prosecution to be served on the defense. 
According to reports, on January 18 this year, Dobson was expected to take his one-year-old daughter to daycare, but allegedly forgot and went to work at the Black River Police Station at 8 a.m., leaving her in his car. The child was found unconscious in the car hours later and was rushed to hospital, where she was pronounced dead. In June, the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions ruled that Dobson should be charged in relation to the child's death. He made his first appearance before the St. Elizabeth Parish Court in Santa Cruz on August 15, where he was granted bail in the sum of $750,000 with surety. And a St. Catherine man who was convicted in 2016 of sexually assaulting a 13-year-old girl is challenging his 42-year sentence in the Court of Appeal. The 40-odd-year-old convict was, con was sentenced to 42 years on account of incest and 25 years on account of grievous sexual assault after he was found guilty in the St. Catherine Home Circuit Court. The judge had ruled that the sentences are to run concurrently and didn't indicate the period Barnes was to serve before any consideration for parole. The Crown led evidence that on a date unknown between January 1, 2012 and April 8, 2013, the applicant had a sexual intercourse with the complainant knowing that she was his niece. The teenager was also forced to participate in oral sex. The matter was reported and he was arrested and charged. Following his arraignment, the man denied sexually assaulting his relative while pointing to his good character. During his trial, he contended that he could not be guilty as he was in prison at the time of the incident. He was, however, found guilty of the offences and sentenced. Aggrieved with his sentence, he has appealed on three grounds. The first is that the judge erred by not clearly revealing how she had arrived at the 42 and 25 year prison terms. The appellant's defense further contended that the judge failed to identify the normal range of sentences for incest and grievous sexual assault and the appropriate starting point within that range to sentence the applicant. Secondly, the applicant contends that the trial judge erred in departing from the sentencing guidelines by imposing a sentence that was manifestly excessive in the circumstances, rendering the sentences for both counts unsafe. According to the sentencing guidelines, the normal range for incest is 2 to 10 years and the usual starting point is 5 years, while the normal range for grievous sexual assault is 15 to 25 years, with the usual starting point to be 15 years. The final ground was that the sentencing judge erroneously considered allegations made by a community member which were presented in the social inquiry report and were deemed to be highly prejudicial and led to the excessively high sentence. A court date is being finalized. In business news, business confidence increased by double-digit levels while consumer confidence inched slightly higher for the third quarter of 2022, reflecting the reopening of the economy. Business leaders from the financial entertainment, hardware and tourism sectors endorsed the optimism captured in Confidence Survey on Tuesday amid expectations of investment. Business confidence at 147.4 points in the third quarter grew by 18.3% over the second quarter. Consumer confidence at 162.2 points in the third quarter increased by 4.2 percentage points over the second quarter. For consumers, half the respondents expect their household income to increase compared to one-third a year ago. The rise in optimism resulted in more persons being willing to take vacations and purchase cars at one-third of respondents compared to one-quarter a year earlier. This optimism, however, doesn't extend to home purchases, which are seen as long-term investments. Consumer confidence remains below pre-pandemic records. The index rose to 158.5 points in the September survey, up from 140 points in the similar period in 2021, but underperformed the record 180.2 points in 2019. One third of consumers expect economic conditions to improve as the economy opens up and the pandemic wanes. Comparatively, 23% or fewer consumers expect business conditions to worsen due to the high cost of living, high crime, ineffective governance and the lack of employment. 
That said, inflation continues to weigh on consumer optimism. In the meantime, the rise in interest rates to fight inflation has negatively impacted on the trading multiples of the stock market, which led to declining prices of equities on the main market of the exchange. The overall market is down nearly 9%. And in the region, the historic first direct flight between Antigua and West Africa is likely to arrive on the Caribbean island on its Independence Day on November 1. The inaugural flight of Antigua Airways, a partnership between the government and Nigerian-based printing firm Marvelous Mike Press, is scheduled to touch down at the VC Bird International Airport next Tuesday morning. The Antigua Prime Minister Gaston Brown confirmed the news while addressing Barbuda MP Trevor Walker in Parliament on Monday. It is unclear how many passengers are expected on the flight, which is set to depart Lagos on October 31, before returning to the motherland on November 6. And in Puerto Rico, federal authorities said on Wednesday that they confiscated more than $26 million worth of cocaine, one of the largest seizures this year. According to United States Customs and Border Protection, more than 2,600 pounds of cocaine were found inside a makeshift boat just south of the island. Authorities said two people aboard the boat, claiming to be U.S. citizens, were arrested. Puerto Rico has long been used as a transfer point for drugs headed to the U.S. mainland and other countries. In 2019, a record $50 million worth of cocaine was seized near the island's southeast region. And on the international scene, the World Health Organization, WHO, says the number of people infected with tuberculosis or TB, including the kind resistant to drugs, rose globally for the first time in years. The WHO says more than 10 million people worldwide were sickened by TB in 2021, a 4.5% rise from the year before. It says about 1.6 million people died. The organization says about 450,000 cases involved people infected with drug-resistant TB, 3% more than in 2020. The COVID-19 pandemic disrupted services for people with TB along with many other health programs. The WHO states that many people went undiagnosed, noting that the number of people newly identified with TB fell from 7 million in 2019 to 5.8 million in 2020. After COVID-19, TB is the world's deadliest infectious disease. It is caused by bacteria that typically affects the lungs. The germs are mostly spread from person to person in the air, such as when an infected individual coughs or sneezes. And the United Nations has warned that the planet is heading for climate catastrophe. It says reports show that nations are far off track in cutting global warming pollution. The UN Environment Programme, UNEP, released its annual emissions gap report showing that current commitments by governments to curb the rise of global temperature are woefully inadequate. The report says current government climate policies leave the world on track to reach an average 2.8 degrees Celsius temperature rise this century, while implementation of current pledges will lower the rise of temperature 2.4 to 2.6 degrees Celsius this century. Government officials will meet from November 6 to 18 at the COP27 climate talks in Egypt to discuss how to limit the warming. And in sports, CEO of Cricket West Indies, Johnny Grave, says splitting the coaching duties for white ball and red ball cricket is one of the possibilities as they commence the search for a replacement for Phil Simmons. Simmons resigned as head coach of the regional men's senior side following the team's early exit from the ICC T20 Men's World Cup. Graves says the board also considered replacing Simmons with an interim coach for the two tests tour of Australia. And in football, Barcelona were eliminated from the Champions League on Wednesday, even before enduring yet another 3-0 beating from Bayern Munich. Atletico Madrid also went out following an extraordinary sequence around a penalty awarded by video review after the final whistle of its 2-2 draw with Bayer Leverkusen. 
Two Spanish powers who were part of the failed Super League launch last year will now miss out on the round of 16 of Europe's top competition. Liverpool's passage into the knockout stage with a game to spare was relatively calm in a 3-0 win at Ajax to join leader Napoli in advancing from free-scoring Group A, which has had 44 goals in 10 games. In more stoppage time drama with video review, Tottenham thought it had won Group D when Hurricane shot the ball into Sporting Lisbon's net with seconds left in a game tied 1-1. And that's it for the news roundup for today. I am Abigail Smythe. See you next time.